All right. Hey, everyone. I'm Leland. I do Android development on Uber's mobile platform team. And today I'm going to be talking about Nanoscope. Uh, Nanoscope is a Android method tracing tool that we open sourced about a month ago now. Uh, we'll go over a little bit about the motivation behind building Nanoscope, specifically uh, some of the conventional Android performance tooling out there and the limitations we ran into. And we'll also talk a little bit about uh, some of the interesting architecture bits. But first, I wanted to give an overview of how you would use Nanoscope. So let's imagine you are building a feature and you uh, notice that one of the screen transitions is too slow, it lags, and you wanna figure out why. Uh, let's see how Nanoscope can help out with that. Um, the first thing you do would uh, connect your device via ADB to your computer. Now let's start the video. And then you'd use the Nanoscope command line tool to run Nanoscope start. And at this point, Nanoscope is tracing all the events that are executing. So you, ex you trigger that transition and click enter to stop tracing. And then Nanoscope pulls all the, uh, all the events off your device and opens it in the Nanoscope visualizer. So this is where you'll be doing most of your performance investigation, panning and zooming around to see, are there any methods that are taking longer than you would expect? Or if there's any other things that are suspicious and there's also, uh, you can search by method name here too. That's Nanoscope's core functionality in a nutshell. But it looks a lot like some of the other uh, performance tooling that already exists. So why is it that we built a new tool? To answer that, we'll take a look at a few of the existing tools that we tried out. The first one is SysTrace. And SysTrace is really great because it provides low-level targeted data. Um, unlike some of the other tools, uh, Unlike some of the other tools, including Nanoscope, SysTrace, you don't have to dig through a lot of, um, sift through a lot of extraneous data. It kind of targets just the information that would be useful, um, that's likely to be useful in a performance investigation. So um, some of these things are CPU usage by core. Um, other things are V-related information. And we found that pretty useful. Um, the other thing this uh, SysTrace does is it provides this automatic analysis on top of that data. Um, one thing it does is it tells you if a frame is taking longer than 16 milliseconds. And if it is, it'll indicate to you what might be going wrong there and how you might be able to fix it. Um, that's one thing, that's a feature that SysTrace has that none of the other tools that we'll talk about can do. So that's a benefit of using SysTrace. Now the blocker we ran into when using SysTrace was that although this information is very useful, it doesn't show up in the context of an app call stack. So when we use SysTrace, we would see things like view inflation taking um, too long. Now that information is uh, interesting, but we weren't able to correlate it back to code that we've actually written. Um, so we weren't able to take that data and turn it into an actionable item. Let's SysTrace. Um, and SysTrace, that's not to say SysTrace is not useful in general. There are definitely cases where um, this will be helpful, uh, specifically if you're tracing a very targeted piece of code, then you already know where in the code base you're, uh, you're taking that trace, um, in which case you can correlate that data that SysTrace gives to you back to the code you've written. So that's SysTrace. The next tool we'll talk about is Android Studio method tracing. And in terms of functionality, this is the closest to Nanoscope, which is also a method tracing based tool. And method tracing in general is useful and it has a benefit of um, tracing every single method that executes. So as opposed to sampling based tools, uh, the method tracing instrumentation is such that there are uh, events logged at the start and end of every method that executes. So that in that way you're guaranteed to get all of the events, uh, all of the methods that are executed will show up in that resulting trace. And that's a, that's a great benefit. Now the downside here is that if you are tracing every single method that executes, in places of high density of calls, you run the risk of really distorting the runtime performance of, of your app that's executing when, you, when you're tracing it. And this is exactly what we were seeing when using Android Studio method tracing. <clears throat> in fact, some of the spans that we were tracing ran upwards of 10 times slower with Android Studio method tracing turned on. And at this level of distortion, we weren't really able to be confident in the conclusions we were drawing based on that data. 
Um, and this actually would have been okay if we could rely on relative durations. So if we were uh, to be able to say this method took 10% of the span and be confident in that, that would have been okay. But the problem with the distortion that's introduced with, Android, uh, with method tracing in general is that it's not proportional to method duration. It's actually proportional to call stack depth uh, because of the way that it's implemented. Now, methods, uh, Android Studio does offer an alternative here, and that's method sampling. And sampling is good because you can actually play with that total overhead. You have a lever to adjust, and that lever is the sampling interval. So on the left-hand side, you can see a representation of a trace taken with a slower sampling interval. And you can see that less measurements are taken. So less me uh, measurements are taken, so that means that the total overhead is lower. But obviously, the trade-off here is that your trace is going to be less detailed. You might be missing interesting information in between those, those samples. Alternatively, you can crank up that sampling interval and get a much more detailed trace. But again, you'll have more measurements here, and you'll distort the runtime performance of the code you're tracing. So we played around with the sampling interval here. And we found that at any given sampling interval, we lacked either the trace detail that we required, or um, we didn't feel like it closely represented what would actually happen in production. So we couldn't trust um, we couldn't trust it in either case here. So at this point, after trying these few tools, we started to wonder, you know, can we build something that provides us both that trace detail and closely represents um, app execution without instrument uh, without the overhead of instrumentation. So that brings us to Nanoscope. <clears throat> and again, Nanoscope is a method tracing based tool. So that means it also has the benefit of not missing any data. So you don't have to worry about any missing data. You know that the tr resulting trace has all the methods that have been executed in your app. And we worked really hard at driving down the overhead that Nanoscope introduces. And in fact, in most cases, the, the instrumentation overhead of Nanoscope is negligible. Uh, a little more on that later. We'll talk, uh, well, I'll give you some hard numbers on that and then see what that looks like in practice. Now let's talk about some of the downsides because there are some. The first one is that Nanoscope is implemented as a fork of AOSP. So what that means for the end user is that you need a device or an emulator running the custom operating system in order to use Nanoscope. But the good news is that we've made that really easy. All you need to do is use the same Nanoscope command line tool and run Nanoscope emulator. And that'll launch an emulator running the Nanoscope OS. And then you can continue using this, the tool with that emulator. If you want to use Nanoscope on a real device, we've also made that really easy. You use the same command line tool, run Nanoscope Flash with a Nexus 6P connected to your computer, and it'll automatically provision that device. Um, and Nexus 6P is the only device we support right now, but we're looking to expand on that list uh, soon. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a high level comparison between Nanoscope and some of the other tools and a little bit about why we built it. Let's take a look at the architecture decisions we've made to achieve this level of efficiency that we've been talking about. So our strategy by design was really simple. Uh, when we start tracing, we allocate a buffer to store all the trace data, and we allocate this buffer upfront because we don't want to pay the cost of any allocations while we're tracing. On every Java call, we do two things. The first thing is we log a method entry event, and that represents a push to the call stack. And then on method exit, we log a uh, pop event, a pop from the call stack. And that's all we need to reconstruct the trace uh, in the trace in the Nanoscope visualizer. So two little pieces of uh, data that we log. Let's take a look at what that looks like in code. This is how we allocate the trace buffer. It's simply an array, an N64 array. And the size of this array is somewhat arbitrary right now. It, it's enough to store 10 million methods. And we're, we may, in the future, change this to be something like a circular buffer. Um, but for now, there's a hard limit of 10 million methods that you can trace at once. The method entry code looks like this. Uh, we first check to see if we're actually tracing. And that's represented by whether or not the trace data array is actually uh, been instantiated. 
And then we store the method pointer into the array. And we store the method pointer directly because we don't, we want to avoid any sort of string manipulation here. So we defer any name resolution to be done out of band. And the last thing we do is store the timestamp so we know when this event actually occurred. And this timestamp is taken directly from a system register. And that's the fastest way we've found so far to actually get the current timestamp. Method exit code uh, looks very much the same. The only thing different here is that we store a null pointer instead of the method pointer to represent a pop. And you'll notice here that we don't actually store the method, method pointer, but that's okay because when we process the trace data, uh, we know which method is at the top of the call stack. So we can then infer which method this pop event is associated with. All right, so that's the core logic for our instrumentation. Let's see where we actually call this from. First place we'll look at is the interpreter. And the interpreter is responsible for directly executing Java bytecode. And as such, part of its responsibility is to handle method invocation. And that's great for us because there is a single method in the interpreter called execute through which all J interpreted Java methods flow. So that, that's, that made it very, very simple for our instrumentation of the interpreter. All we needed to do was add the method start and method end at appropriate places in this execute method. And that's all we needed to do to, uh, to instrument all of the interpreted methods. Now, if we were to stop here, Nanoscope would work fine and you would get a resulting trace that has all the interpreted methods, but that trace would actually be incomplete. And that's because, as it turns out, not all methods are interpreted. For performance reasons, some methods are compiled down into machine instructions to be executed directly by the processor. And in this way, you can execute the method logic without going into the interpreter, which has a performance overhead associated with it. But that makes our instrumentation a bit harder here. There is no single method that we can instrument like there was for the interpreter. Uh, for example, you could have a compiled method that directly calls another compiled method without ever going, direct, going back to the VM. So there's no, there's no method in, the, in C++ that we can instrument and capture that. So our strategy for, the, for compiled methods is to generate the machine instructions necessary for our instrumentation. So that looks like this. This is the assembly we generate in the compiler for 64-bit uh, ARM. And what would have been simpler here is generating the instructions to call the method start and method end methods that we, uh, that we defined earlier, but that, then we'd be paying the cost of a method call. So we wanted to avoid that. So instead we inline the necessary assembly to instrument the compiled methods here. We also support 32-bit ARM and also x86 for the emulator. <clears throat> Let's do a bit of a recap of uh, some of the architecture decisions we've made. We've pruned it down to just a single branch statement, and that's just to check to see whether or not we're tracing. We've inlined the assembly required for uh, the instrumentation of compiled methods. There are zero allocations while we're tracing, so we don't have to pay the cost of any allocations. We retrieve the timestamp directly from, the from a system register, which is really fast. And we've minimized the amount of reads and writes we do, uh, memory reads and writes. And after obsessing with efficiency, we're really happy with the results. And we've measured the per method overhead of Nanoscope to be only 20 nanoseconds. Okay, so 20 nanoseconds, what does that actually look like at runtime? Let's take a look at this. Okay, on the left-hand side is Nanoscope, right-hand side is Android Studio. So Nanoscope's already done. Uh, that's 0.2 seconds here. This is just about what we see in production. And, <laughs> and don't be too hard on uh, Android Studio because we're literally tracing millions of methods in this transition. And even though millions of methods are being executed and traced by both tools, Nanoscope's overhead is imperceptible. And and that's the power of Nanoscope. At Uber, um, we simply no longer have to worry about 
missing or distorted data when doing performance investigations. And that's, that's all I have here. Um, I have some links here that you might be interested in. The first one is our release blog post. Um, if you haven't read that already, check it out. And the second two are the Nanoscope repos. So the first one is the, kind of the landing page. So if you wanna figure out how to install and use Nanoscope, go to that first repo. Uh, it also has a code for the command line tool and the Nanoscope visualizer. The second one is the code for the actual AOSP fork part of Nanoscope. So if you're interested in that, check it out. 